As custodians of historical records, archivists are responsible for preserving historical records and making them available to users. Researchers may vary from professional historians and genealogists to journalists, government officials, and students. The diversity of researchers requires the archivist have a unique combination of customer service and research skills to better match researchers with the sources they need. I can't think of a better place to connect researchers with historical records than the Baseball Hall of Fame and Museum in Cooperstown, New York. Since 1939, the Baseball Hall of Fame and Museum has housed the stories honoring the greats of baseball's past. With over 39,000 three-dimensional artifacts, 250,000 photographs, and millions of books and documents, as a researcher, finding exactly what you need may be time-consuming and difficult. We are here today with Jim Gates, Library Director at the National Baseball Hall of Fame and Museum, who will help us understand how to connect researchers with the right archival resources. Hello, Jim. Hello, Asia. Welcome to Cooperstown. Thank you. Um, so I'd like to start off um, with a question about the number of inquiries the, uh, the library receives? Well, as you may well guess, baseball is a very popular topic and every year our staff handles uh, thousands and thousands of questions. Uh, they arrive via email, faxes, phone calls, letters. We also have about 10,000 people will walk into the GMATI Research Center to ask a question on site. What kinds of, of questions do people ask? Well, just about anything you can think of. Uh, questions will come in from third graders with a homework problem to PhD candidates working on dissertations. We also get a lot of questions from the media, print and broadcast journalists who use us on a daily basis. And many of our staff get to know them very well because we talk to them every day. Uh, you would also get questions from baseball teams, from businesses that plan to use baseball in some sort of advertising campaign. Uh, questions would also come in from regular baseball fans, just want to know something very quick. If uh, the President of the United States is going to use baseball in a speech, the speech writing staff will contact us to confirm that the information is correct. We regularly receive uh, questions from members of Congress, also from the United States Supreme Court. Um, and it's not unusual to get a call from a drunk at a bar with a $20 bet writing on a question. <laughs> so when the phone rings, it could be Joe's Bar and Grill or the White House. How important is it for you as library director to know what people um, are looking for before they actually make it in here? Well, we, you know, after so many years, we kind of have an idea of what people use most often, and so we try to make sure that that material is readily available. And uh, we also try to anticipate as changes in baseball history happen, as events happen, that we do focus on obtaining material that will meet future research needs. It's very important for an archivist quite often to think 50 or 100 years in advance. So we will look at things, and we have a committee meeting to look at new acquisitions, and we'll say, well, you know, this is a very common that everybody knows what it is, but will they in 100 years? And if not, uh, we want to make sure we have a copy. Can you tell us about finding aids and what those tools uh, do for both archivists and researchers? Well, the, the most important thing that we work with when someone comes in and is looking for something is we need to find out what they really want. I would say that the majority of people who have a question are asking not in the right direction or they're asking the wrong question. And so it's important for us to you know, ask a little bit more and find out what they really want. And quite often it's fairly simple. Um, you know, I think we laugh about it in library school, this whole reference interview thing, but when you're out there in the field and you're dealing with patrons every day, you realize how important it is. Uh, once we've determined what the patron wants, we then start looking at the available finding tools. And the first is, at any library, would be the catalog, whether it's still in a, a drawer full of cards or whether it's online, you want to do an author title subject or keyword search to see what materials you have that fits their needs. Uh, for some collections where they're rather large, we've also created what's called a finding aid. And a finding aid is a more detailed listing. Here at our library, it would be on the file level, which identifies everything that's in a particular file, so that a researcher can, instead of saying, I need all 135 boxes, they'll say, I need box 21, file 14. And again, that allows them to focus their time and effort on the material they really need. Have you ever had to change a finding aid as a result of working with 
a researcher? Absolutely. Uh, we look at finding aids all the time. They're very easy to modify and update, which we do on a regular basis. And there are three ways that happens. The first is uh, just by the staff using the collection or reviewing the finding aid and finding, uh, say, a mistake or a correction that needs to be made. Or we find a document in there that is particularly important and we want to highlight that in the finding aid. Uh, the second means uh, by which we change a finding aid comes from the patron themselves. Uh, as you mentioned in the introduction, we have millions of items in our collection and it's not possible for any one member of the staff to read everything. So it's not unusual when a patron comes to use the material, that's the first time we've actually seen that particular file or that particular document. And uh, they'll bring something to our attention and we'll modify the finding aid as well. Uh, the final way is that when we create the finding aid, we usually try to review them with the donor, if the donor is still alive, to make sure that we have biographical information correct or that we have other data in there that the family or the donor feels is important that should be stipulated in the uh, material that we're putting out for the public to see. How might an interview change based on the type of researcher? that's making an inquiry? Well, uh, age has a lot to do with it. Uh, say an elementary school uh, student is in doing research on Lou Gehrig. Uh, we have uh, any number of biographies that have been published. We have a clipping file on Lou Gehrig. There's a photo file, material like that. But we also have Lou Gehrig's personal family scrapbook. Now, we would not let a third grader have access to that for obvious reasons of security and uh, preservation. But if we have a, a serious biographer in who's writing a um, you know, a book, uh, or there's a documentary crew in that's doing, a, you know, an hour-long piece for the History Channel or Arts and Entertainment or something like that, we will try to make those um, materials available for them to use. So we do take a look at who the individual is and uh, try to, you know, find something that best fits their needs. We live in an ever-changing world. We have many ways to access information. Um, how do you respond to the various ways of making inquiries, email, phone, in person? Well, when I first arrived in Cooperstown, there was no email here, and so I've seen the changes come through because now the majority of our questions come directly via email. Uh, we actually have at our website uh, an email address, research at Baseball Hall, which comes right to the library, so they don't even have to track anybody down to send us a question. And I would say most of the questions that come in or something we can answer very quickly off the top of our heads or just by sending someone a link to a particular uh, source, uh, source on the internet. Some of them require a bit more work and so we respond saying, you know, this is going to take us five or six hours of time, there is a fee for that. Uh, or we don't think we have that information here. I think one of the most valuable uh, resources that we have is a telephone because uh, I keep a, a Rolodex of resources and researchers at other institutions who can help. And I don't hesitate to contact someone and say, I have someone here looking for this, which we don't have. Uh, can you help them out? And of course, being an archivist or a librarian elsewhere, they want to help out. And so we just transfer the question over to them. Uh, so it, it does depend, uh, but we do see most of our questions now coming in through email and most of our responses going out through email. Thank you so much for joining us today, Jim. Oh, you're very welcome. It was a pleasure having you here. For more information about reference interviews, please go to the Strengthening Archives website.